<clears throat> this entire year, Matthew and I have focused our sermons upon the God who was and who is and is to come. We're getting close to the end of this year, and it is a time when we have sermons that certainly fit the theme, but also fit with what's going on in our lives. And so I know that over the next several weeks, we'll have sermons about being thankful, sermons about Jesus and His incarnation here on earth, and uh, certainly by the end of the year, a sermon that will summarize what we have learned. I think it's good for us to take just a moment and think about who God is, and specifically what our view is about God. How do you view God? What, what do you see when you think of God? Now, some people in the world, or maybe even in this room, think of God and visualize God in your mind as an old man with a white beard sitting on a puffy cloud. I don't know, the Bible really doesn't depict him in that way. But really, instead of looking at God as something that's physical, I think it's good. And what we've tried to do throughout this entire year is pick out some attributes of God. That's really who God is. Who God is is not necessarily what He looks like, but who God is is really how He behaves. Who He is in His character, in His personality. This morning, I think it's good for us to examine that. Because what do you really believe about God? What do you believe? What do you think about God? What's in your heart of hearts when you think about God? Let me ask you this. Are you pursuing a deeper faith in God? That's really what our whole purpose has been this entire year is that you're pursuing a deeper faith in the God that was and is and is to come. That you are better off now than you were in January with your faith and your understanding about this God that we serve. And I hope that what you've learned is that you're, you're taking it and that you're sharing it with other people. That's another purpose of this. That you're not just taking this information and bottling it up and just using it for your own benefit, but you're taking what you're learning and you're sharing it. You're telling other people about the God who was and is and is to come. That's important for us to consider. Because you see, your view... And your belief, your faith about God affects every aspect of your life. Every aspect of your life. You know, there's some people in the world today that, that see God as, as a horrible, terrible, vengeful, wrathful God. And, so, and their lives reflect that view of God. But what's your view? How do you see God? I hope that you see Him as good. I do, because how you view God is going to affect every bit of who you are and how you behave. It's either going to strengthen your faith, or it's going to weaken you and cause you uncertainty in your faith. Your view, your belief about God is either going to give you great courage to face whatever is ahead of you, or it's going to heighten your fears. You're going to see God as something that should be completely, uh, you should be standing before Him fearful. Or, your view of God is going to cause you to obey Him. You're going to see what He's asked you to do, and you're going to do whatever He's asked you to do. What does Jesus say? If you love me, you keep my commandments. You see, your view of God motivates you and what you're going to do and how you're going to respond to what He's asking. Or it's going to cause you to rebel against Him. You may be somebody that views God as somebody who is an oppressor, who set up these rules and these standards that you can't live by and therefore I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to do whatever I want and rebel against Him. Or your view of God is going to make you seek His will. You're going to grow in your faith. You're going to find out what you need to do to please Him. And your faith is going to be deepened in Him because you want to please Him. Or it's going to be where you're choosing your own way. 
You say, I know that this is what God has asked me to do, but I'm just going to go my own way. You know, your view of God will either allow you to draw closer to Him. You see Him as somebody that you want to have a friendship and a relationship with. Or it's going to cause you to separate yourself from Him. And say, I don't want to have anything to do with this God who is, or who was and who is, and is to come. Your view of God is everything. And I hope that at the core foundational part of who you are in your heart of hearts, that you view God as a good God. I think that when we view God as good, our outlook on life and on how we view things and how we do things has a positive aspect in our lives. It it translates really well over into our own behaviors and our own thoughts. If you believe God is good, then things around you can be good. That's what I hope for us today. But not just that God is good, we're just saying God is good is so good. So good. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That word so is an important word, isn't it, in that verse? It teaches the same thing if we were to leave it out. It really does. The principle is there. For God loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. No one's going to argue with you about that. But the Holy Spirit through John wrote that God so loved the world. His love was so magnificent and phenomenal that He gave His only begotten Son. He loved you so much to the level that He was willing to give His only Son as a sacrifice for you. You see, that word so is important. It's important in this phrase too. God is so good. Jesus says so. Jeremy read for us just a moment ago from Mark chapter 10 and verse 17 through 18. God is so good. Jesus says it. Here Jesus is coming and He's teaching and he's blessing people. And it says he was setting up on out on a journey, and this man ran up to him, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus could have easily said, Well, here's what you need to do. He's done this before. He's even, he even says, You know, right here in, this, in the commands, here's the commandments that you need to obey. You need to do those things. He tells him, you need to sell all of your possessions. He could have just answered him right there, but Jesus takes a moment to make this point right here. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. God is so good, there's no one else that can compare. Now, the the phrase good teacher that we find right here, this title was really never applied to any rabbis during Jesus' day because it implies the, the sinless or the complete goodness that is found. And really, that is only found in God. And Jesus and everyone recognized right here that this man is calling him by this unique title, good teacher. Only God was called good in the ancient times by the ancient rabbis. So why do you call me good, he says. This was not Jesus denying his deity. He wasn't saying that, you know, you're calling me good, but really it's only God that's good. I'm not equal with God. No, that's not what Jesus is is doing. Instead, he invites this young man to reflect upon the goodness of God. It's as if Jesus was saying to him, do you really even know what you're saying when you call me good? Have you ever thought about it? You realize what you're saying? You're calling me good and complete and sinless. Just think about that for just a moment, is what he says. 
God alone is good. This goodness of God is proclaimed all throughout the Psalms and in the Proverbs in the Old Testament. In Psalm 106 and verse 1, it begins with, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. You'll find this phrase over and over and over again. It's not just here in 106, it's also in 107 verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness. Kindness is everlasting. And then again, in Psalm 118 and verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. God is so good. He is so good. This morning I want us to look at four qualities that demonstrate God's goodness and shows us just how good He is. Go over with me to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. It's an interesting passage here. Israel has been rebellious. They've been at the foot of Mount Sinai. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. They're at Mount Sinai and they have been receiving the Ten Commandments, but don't really think that they knew what they were getting themselves into because while Moses has disappeared upon this mountain, they're down at the base of it, partying it up. They erect for themselves, or ask Aaron to do so, and the the fella, he does it. Takes all their gold from Egypt, melts it down, and forms a golden calf for them to worship. They don't get away with it. Moses comes down and God is... Upset. He calls them an obstinate people, a matter of fact. In verse 5 of chapter 33, the people are obstinate. They're hard headed. They're stubborn. They rebel. But they repent for a time. Uh, they, they begin to be mourning, uh, they begin to mourn their situation. And, and, uh, they set up tents right outside the camp and they begin to, Get, try to get their lives right back on track. And it is here where the people see Moses go into this tent and meet with God and have a conversation with God face to face. When Moses goes into the tent, this pillar comes down, of cl- this cloud comes down, and God has a conversation with Moses, and Moses has a conversation with God. He speaks to him, the Bible says, he speaks to him as, as a friend speaks to with another friend. That's the kind of relationship that Moses has with God. Moses speaks with God and basically says, how will people know that you are with us again and I and the people of Israel have found favor with you? How will we know this? Verse 16, let's set this up, of chapter 33. He says, how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? How can we know that our relationship is good with you again? Is it not by your going with us so that we and I and your people may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? That's Moses' question towards God. Wouldn't it be evidence that if you are with us, that you are going to find favor with us. That that everybody else should know that, that our relationship is good with you. Verse 17, the Lord says to Moses, I will also do this. So he's going to do that thing. I'm going to be with you. But here's what else I'm going to do. And this may be a lesson for Moses more than anybody else right here. Moses needed some assurance that his and the people of Israel's relationship with God was in good standing. And so the Lord says, here's what I'll also do. I'll do this thing of which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, here's this conversation. So God says that, now Moses interjects and says, I pray that you'll show me your glory. 
God says, I'll do this thing. I'll be with you. And then Moses says, give, give me more. Show me your glory. Verse 19, and he said, I myself, this is God speaking, will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. You want to know what the goodness of God is? It's God demonstrating His grace and His compassion. That's the goodness of God. Moses prays, show me your glory. So keep reading with me just for a moment. Verse 20, he says, He said to him, you cannot see my face. This is God speaking to Moses. You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about that while my glory is passing by, the grace and the compassion, while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then while I take my hand away, you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses gets a glimpse of the glory of God. He gets a glimpse, a glimpse of what the goodness of God is. And God is so good that He protects Moses. He takes him, and I love this right here, he, put, he says, I will take you and I will put you into this cleft of the rock. Moses doesn't put himself under protection. God puts him under protection. Why? Because he's so good. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior is He. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. I look among and I see the goodness of God. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. Everything else out there is dry and it's thirsty. And God protects and puts you under His wing. He hides you there. He hides my life in the depths of His love and He covers me there with His hand. God is so good that His grace and His compassion encapsulates just how good He is. He's so good that He takes Moses and puts him under protection when His glory passes by. He does the same for us. God is so good. But there are times that you may be standing on the side of a cliff, or at least you feel that way. There's no hope, but God takes that rock that seems so dangerous that you're standing on and places you there and covers you up with His hand. That's how good God is. He's so good. So good. Number two, God's goodness is wonderful. Is wonderful. Psalm 139 and verse 14 I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This makes it so personal, doesn't it? You can break this verse down, at least I have in my mind. Breaking this down into God's goodness is displayed personally for me. He has made me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Sometimes we don't feel that way, do we? Sometimes the ailments and the physicality of our lives get the best of us. I was coming down off of a deer stand last night, or yesterday afternoon. My knee didn't want to work the way it should. It didn't feel good. I even said to Dad, I'm having trouble with this knee. 
I'm still fearfully, wonderfully made, and so are you. You may have things that you're dealing with in the physical world. You may have cancer to deal with. You may have just ailments, back aches, knee aches, headaches, whatever you're dealing with in your life. You are still fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know why? Because the plan of God is to create man and man is to die, deteriorate, and trust in God throughout his whole life when those physical things are going on enough to where you're faithful to Him and you'll live with Him throughout all of eternity. You are fearfully, wonderfully made because you are following the exact plan of God. Every time that you have a headache, say, oh, this is, the, this is God's plan that I am not perfect that I have to deal with these things, but God has made me. See the positive spin on it? God has made me to appreciate, even when I'm facing these horrible things in my life, God has made me to appreciate the plan of God that it's not always going to be this way. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. It's very personal, isn't it? The last part of this verse says, Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. This part of the verse helps us to see the wonderful things that are around us in creation. This time of year, just God's creation is on display as God paints the sky just about every evening. Have you noticed? And if you get up early enough right now, you can see how God paints it in the morning as well. I was trying to describe to Tim Nelson last week some of the sunsets and the sunrises. Imagine never have seen that. But here's what I know about Tim Nelson. He has a positive outlook on life. I love when Tim comes to visit me. Well, all of us, but he spends a lot of time with me. I love it because it reminds me to be positive. It reminds me just how wonderful and how good God is. God doesn't just put His goodness on display for us in the evenings or in the mornings. You go outside and look up at the stars of the sky and you see it all over again. Another form of God's goodness. That's in creation. But wonderful are your works, not just in the things that we see, but the arbitrary things, the things that are abstract. Wonderful are God's works that He has a plan for us. That while we were sin sinful and man has fallen away from Him, He has worked it out in His scheme of redemption to take you from this kingdom of darkness and transfer you into the kingdom of His marvelous Son. It's a kingdom of light. That is a wonderful work of God. And that all takes place. Do you know why? Because God is so good. Wonderful are His works. And I'm hoping it that your soul knows it very well. God's goodness is not just wonderful, but it is effective. Go over with me to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50 is the very end of this book. It's the, it's the last bit of Joseph's life. And Joseph had, had a horrible, horrible life. His brothers had just turned against him and has, uh, sold him into slavery. But Joseph's life didn't end right there. Joseph went on to be successful in Egypt and really to pretty much be in control of the modern world of his time. Highly respected, highly successful. His brothers come back after this famine happens and, and they, the only place they can find food is in Egypt. And so his brothers come back and it is a story of redemption. When Joseph could have spoken and had his brothers killed because of all the horrible things that they had done. Instead, Joseph shows compassion. Joseph takes a moment, right here, has a conversation with his brothers. And he says this, As for you, you meant evil against me. See, they hated him. And his brothers wanted evil against him. 
But he says, God meant it for good. God meant it for good. Why? In order to bring about this present result. The effectiveness of God's goodness is displayed right there in Joseph's life and his relationship with his brothers. This perfect result, Joseph says, is to preserve many people alive. Not just his own family, but through the famine, he gets the whole modern world of that time through that difficult time. But not just there, there's a greater meaning behind that. Preserve many people alive. You can stretch that all, all over to the slavery of, pe- of the people of Israel and their deliverance from that slavery and the whole plan of God to bring about His people in the fulfillment of the promise that He gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's God's goodness. It is effective. God's goodness works every single time. God can take the hardest of situations, the most difficult things, the toughest of circumstances that you're facing right now and bring about goodness. His results, His purpose, His plan, His goodness all on display for you. Romans 8, 28, such an encouraging positive passage. Paul writes and says, For we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Not your purpose, His purpose. See, a lot of times we think, well, the goodness has got to be what I want. The goodness is, is, that, I, that, that a desire is, is how I plan it out for my life, my purpose. That's not what this verse says right here. God works out together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, His plan, His goodness is displayed in your life. Not yours. It may not look good from your perspective. Even how God works it all out. Even the effectiveness of it. You may say, God, how is this all supposed to work? How is this good? But from God's perspective, He knows exactly what to do. And His goodness works every single time. His goodness is effective. Every single time. Lastly, God's goodness is abundant. It's abundant. Psalm 31 and verse 19 The psalmist writes and says, How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. God's goodness is stored up. It's available. Throughout the summer months, we can up all of our green beans and tomatoes and store our potatoes and peppers and pickles. Oh my goodness, it's so wonderful. I love getting out a jar of tomato juice that sometimes is a year old. A year old! And I crack it open. And you know what the first thing I do is, don't you? I want to smell it. Well, I want to know if it's still good or not, for sure. But I also know that it smells so good. Even after a year. I've stored it up so that later on, it's available to us. God's goodness is so great. And He has stored it up for you. Well, He stored it up for those who will fear Him. That's the goodness. But, th- but those who fear Him, you're not going to run out of God's goodness. We always say, if we can get 40 jars, quart-sized jars of green beans, 
that, that we would be happy. We, that'll last us an entire year. At least it did a few years ago. Now my teenage kids are eating a lot more. We may need at least 50-something from now on. But if I can get that to stretch, then we've got plenty. But boy, when it gets down to the last few jars and you start thinking, when are we going to start harvesting and, and getting some more? Maybe we need to ration it out, right? We start thinking, we're only going to make this when, when we will appreciate the meal. <laughs> and if you come over and eat with us, you better appreciate that green bean. <laughs> because we're rationing it out. God's goodness is abundant. It's great. There's no chance. There's no way He's going to run out of this kind of goodness. You don't have to worry about storing it up for yourself. He has it in store for you. What a beautiful thing. God's goodness. God is so good. When you leave here this morning, attack life with a positive attitude knowing that God is so good. He's so good that He doesn't leave mankind hanging in the terrible situation of our sin. He had a plan for our redemption from the very beginning of time. Before the foundation of the world, the plan was to redeem man through His Son, Jesus Christ. God is so good. If you want to demonstrate God's goodness this morning, you, every single person in here, should respond to the Lord's invitation. And I'll tell you why. Either you are one who needs to respond because you need a relationship with this good God. and He is there to provide you the salvation that you so desire through His Son, Jesus Christ. For He sent His Son on this earth to die in your stead. And when you're washed in His blood by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you demonstrate God's goodness. There are people in this room that need to do that. There's also people in this room, and that's everybody else, who can demonstrate God's goodness by remaining faithful to Him and having a positive outlook on life. So you're either in the first category needing to respond or you're in the second category needing to respond and having this positive attitude displaying God's goodness. Everybody in here can respond this morning in some way or another. Some of you may have already obeyed the gospel, but your outlook on life has not been positive. You have forgotten about the goodness of God. Perhaps your view of God has separated you from Him. And now is the time for you to come back and reestablish that relationship with the good God that we serve. The God who was and is and is to come. God is so good. If you need to respond, come as together we stand and as we sing.